hope you're all well and um, so as I said we've finished looking at all the individual research methods so now we're going to look in detail at um, the two theoretical perspectives so we've got a lesson today on positivism so positive views on social research and then tomorrow we will be looking at interpretivist views on research okay so um, essentially I've broken it down into three paragraphs for you and um, so three different points we're going to look at we're going to start by looking at their wider perspective on society so how they see us as individuals how they think we're like um, sociology can be a science then we're going to refine it a little bit more for the second paragraph and look at what their philosophies are for actually studying it and in our third and final paragraph we're going to refine it even more by relating everything we know to a specific example of a research method and um, so that's what we're looking at today so what I've done is um, to look, uh, look at this in more um, focused terms um, they think sociology is a science and they believe that humans can be studied in the exact same way that any other scientific topic is studied so I've picked a really easy example of a scientific experiment that you would have done in middle school which is just measuring the temperature that water boils at so they've got three different um, ideas on, on why this is a scientific study so first of all is looking at how um, an external influence has an impact on an internal influence so um, uh, how an uh, independent variable affects a dependent variable so in this case the independent variable is the heat and that has a direct effect the dependent variable on um, on, has an impact on the water boiling so it's how external forces have an impact on, on something internal and they believe that once you've done this experiment you've come up with a fact so it is a fact the temperature that water boils at what, what, what temperature does water boil at? and so water boils at 100 degrees and it always will do so you've established a fact and then um, Finally, um, they believe that the sociologist, um, or the scientist, sorry, in this case, should have no influence on their research. So, um, essentially, what they say is that um, the water is going to boil at 100 degrees no matter what. So, n nothing the researcher does um, has any influence on that. So, I, um, it, it, instead of it being like how the, um, social, uh, the scientist um, sees the experiment going it's it's using precise measurements in this case a thermometer to track what temperature the water boils at so how this can be done in sociology so I've given you an example here of something they'd like to use that we looked at before which is official statistics so what we can see here and what I would like you to do is as I explain this can you um you write around the table that um, you've got in front of you or you can write it like um write the statistics down in your book and, and note it down however you want to organise your notes but essentially make sure you get these three points noted down so what we can see here is they what we said before is they're looking at cause and effect so before we looked at how the independent variable of the heat had an effect on the dependent variable of water in this case we can see that the external variable um, so the external factor of the length of a present sentence has um, an internal effect on the individual so what this is what this suggests is shorter prison sentences increase the risk of offending so we've established a cause and effect just like we can do in science we can do that with people and their behavior now positivists if you remember they do not see us as having any free will free will whatsoever um, they see our behaviours completely controlled by external forces and this allows us to see that because it shows it's not the human's choice whether they reoffend, it's their experience of the prison system. And again, it's not the sociologist's belief or understanding that has an impact on the research, um, so if you use objective um, measures, so in this case percentages and statistics, um, and the, um, rather than like just guessing or talking to people about what impact it has so on the next page you have got four questions to answer about that so um, 
I'll just start you to answer that, Ace. The hardest one's the last few questions. So just to remind you, they um it will just remind you what the Bobo doll study was. That was the study where we saw that the sociologist believed that um violent media had an impact on people's behaviour. So he showed a clip of um of someone beating up a Bobo doll to children. And then he saw that they copied that behaviour. So if you can just explain how that shows um, cause and effect and um, how it were, he used objective measures to record this and how he saw this as a social fact. And finally, um, as your evaluation, you want to say they've assumed that humans have no free will. Now, that's quite easy to criticise. And what I would suggest with that is a specific example. So if you think of um, when someone sees a red traffic light, they stop. That suggests that um, the external variable of the traffic light, the independent variable of the traffic light has an impact on the dependent variable of the person's actions, they stop. However, there is always going to be some people that go through that traffic light. That means one, we have free will, but equally it means we need to look into the meaning why some people stop and some people don't. So for example, if someone's driven through a traffic light, it might be because they're in a rush, they think no one's around, they think they're going to get away with it, um, they think that um, they don't have to follow the rules. And equally, there's, there's loads of reasons why someone might stop at a red traffic light. Maybe they've been involved in an accident before. So what this suggests is, it's no good just studying people in cause and effect and assuming we've got no consciousness. Because actually, we do have free will and there's meaning behind our actions that need to be looked at as well. Okay, paragraph two then, looking at a kind of um, more focused views on research methods. So this is what's important to positivists. Now, when you're st they, we know they want this to be objective. When you're studying something like a rock, it's easy to be detached. You're not going to develop any strong feelings to that rock. Um, but when you're studying people, it's much harder to be detached. You, um, very quickly, we develop emotions towards people. Um, we like them, we dislike them, or, or particular social topics like poverty. We might have prior meaning with it. So what they think is important is to use research methods where those emotions don't have an influence on your research. So they want you to be detached. Um, so detached methods is where you've got no, ideally no direct contact with the group you're studying. So if you remember the Milgram study, um, the um, actual researcher was detached, he hired actors to get involved for him. And um, questionnaires are sent out or structured into your descriptive so you can't change based on your emotions at the time. So those research methods are detached. Um, secondly, it's not good enough, we didn't just like boil one cup of water and thought, oh well, 100 degrees, that's it. You, um, you repeat the method again and again and again to collect more evidence. So in this case, um, what we would call this is verification. You, the more and more information you can gain um, to prove something develops a social fact. So if you do a questionnaire that finds a link between poverty and poor chances in education and you get similar results from thousands of other people, you have identified a social fact. So that is called verification. You've proven something. That means they have to use reliable methods, so methods that you can repeat in their entirety, like questionnaires where you can do it again and again and again. And finally, we can use the, um, what positive is actually, they're quite, um, they see themselves as quite good guys. So with this cause and effect, you can make suggestions for improvement to society. So very early positivists like work to the government to make suggestions. So um, if you find like poverty has an impact on education, you can put policies in place to have an impact on that. Like um, you could develop um, free school meals, for example. Okay. So using that information you've just got, again, you've got four, diff um, four questions, but your evaluation here is identify with um, why feminists disagree with this type of research. Think about what we said with feminists, why they don't like things like structured interviews, how they think it reinforces patriarchy to help you answer that. If you're stuck with any of those questions, just let me know. Okay. And finally, we want to apply what everything we've learned today in a third paragraph on a specific research method. Um, so what we've got here is we've got four research methods that they like. Pick whichever one you feel most comfortable talking about. Um, structured interviews, questionnaires, experiments and official statistics. Um, explain why this method is detached, allows you to find cause and effect and can be used to gain verification um, using very kind of precise measure and measurements. 
add to valuation with a problem that you've already identified with that research method and that's the three different points you need to know for positivism. Again it's our first time looking at this theory so if you're not sure and you're struggling with it email me and let me know.